Research Methods in Cognitive Psychology Researchers employ a variety of research methods. These methods include laboratory or other controlled experiments, psychobiological research, self-reports, case studies, naturalistic observation, and computer simulations and artificial intelligence. Each of these methods will be discussed in this video and to better understand the specific methods used by cognitive psychologists, one must first grasp the goals of research in cognitive psychology. Briefly, research goals include data gathering, data analysis, theory development, hypothesis formulation, hypothesis testing, and perhaps even application to settings outside the research environment. Often, researchers simply seek to gather as much information as possible about a particular phenomenon. They may or may not have preconceived notions regarding what they may find while gathering the data. Their research focuses on describing particular cognitive phenomena such as how people recognize faces or how they develop expertise. Data gathering reflects an empirical aspect of the scientific enterprise. Once there are sufficient data on the cognitive phenomenon of interest, cognitive psychologists use various methods for drawing inferences from the data. Ideally, they use multiple converging types of evidence to support their hypothesis. Sometimes, just a quick glance at the data leads to intuitive inferences regarding patterns that emerge from those data. More commonly, however, researchers use various statistical means of analyzing the data. Data gathering and statistical analysis aid researchers in describing cognitive phenomena. No scientific pursuit could get far without such descriptions. However, most cognitive psychologists want to understand more than the what of cognition. Most also seek to understand the how and the why of thinking. That is, researchers seek ways to explain cognition as well as to describe it. To move beyond descriptions, cognitive psychologists must leap forward from what is observed directly to what can be inferred regarding observations. A theory is an organized body of general explanatory principles regarding a phenomenon, usually based on observations. We seek to test a theory and thereby to see whether it has the power to predict certain aspects of the phenomena with which it deals. In other words, our thought processes, if our theory is correct, then whenever X occurs, outcome y should result. This process results in the generation of hypotheses or tentative proposals regarding expected empirical consequences of the theory such as the outcomes of research. Next, we test our hypothesis through experimentation. Even if particular findings appear to confirm a given hypothesis, the findings must be subjected to statistical analysis to determine their statistical significance. Statistical significance indicates the likelihood that a given set of results would be obtained if only chance factors were in operation. For example, a statistical significance level of 0 0.05 would mean that the likelihood of a given set of data would be a mere 5% if only chance factors were operating. Therefore, the results are not likely to be due merely to chance. Through this method, we can decide to retain or reject hypothesis. Once our hypothetical predictions have been experimentally tested and statistically analyzed, the findings from those experiments may need to further work. For example, the psychologist may engage in further data gathering, data analysis, theory development, hypothesis formulation, and hypothesis testing. Based on the hypotheses that were retained and or rejected, the theory may have to be revised. In addition,
In addition, many cognitive psychologists hope to use insights gained from research to help people use cognition in real-life situations. Some research in cognitive psychology is applied from the start. It seeks to help people improve their lives and the conditions under which they live their lives. Thus, basic research may lead to everyday applications. For each of these purposes, different research methods offer different advantages and disadvantages. Experiments on Human Behavior in controlled experimental designs, an experimenter will usually conduct research in a laboratory setting. The experimenter controls as many aspects of the experimental situation as possible. There are basically two kinds of variables in any given experiment. The independent variables are aspects of an investigation that are individually manipulated or carefully regulated by the experimenter, while other aspects of the investigation are held constant or not subject to variation. Dependent variables, on the other hand, are outcome responses, the values of which depend on how one or more independent variables influence or affect the participants in the experiment. When you tell some student research participants that they will do very well on a task, but you do not say anything to other participants, the independent variable is the amount of information that the students are given about their expected task performance. The, the dependent variable is how well both groups actually perform the task, that is, their score on the math test, for example. When the experimenter manipulates the independent variables, he or she controls for the effects of irrelevant variables and observes the effects on the dependent variables. These irrelevant variables that are held constant are called control variables. Another type of variable is the confounding variable. Confounding variables are a type of irrelevant variable that has been left uncontrolled in a study. In implementing the experimental method, experimenters must use a representative and random sample of the population of interest. They must exert rigorous control over the experimental conditions so that they know that the observed effects can be attributed to variations in the independent variable and nothing else. The experimenter also must randomly assign participants to the treatment and control conditions. Many different dependent variables are used in cognitive psychological research. Two common variables are percent correct or its additive inverse, error rate, and reaction time. These measures are popular because they can tell the investigator, respectively, the accuracy and speed of mental processing. Independent and dependent variables must be chosen with great care because no matter what processes one is observing, what is learned from an experiment will depend almost exclusively on the variables one chooses to isolate from the often complex behavior one is observing. Another type of research in psychology are correlational studies. Correlational studies are often the method of choice when researchers do not want to deceive their subjects by using manipulations in an experiment or when they are interested in factors that cannot be manipulated ethically. However, because researchers do not have any control over, over the experimental conditions, causality cannot be inferred from correlational studies. A correlation is a description of a relationship. The correlation coefficient describes the strength of the relationship. The closer the coefficient is to 1, either positive or negative, the stronger the relationship between the variables is. 
The sign positive or negative of the coefficient variables describes the direction of the relationship. A positive relationship indicates that as one variable increases, another variable also increases. A negative relationship indicates that as the measure of one variable increases, the measure of another variable decreases. No correlation that is when the coefficient is zero indicates that there is no pattern or, or relationship in the change of two variables. In this final case, both variables may change but the variables do not vary together in a consistent pattern. Psychobiological Research Through psychobiological research, investigators study the relationship between cognitive performance and cerebral events and structures. Among the techniques used in psychobiological research generally fall into three categories. Techniques for studying an individual's brain post-mortem or after the death of an individual relating the individual's cognitive function prior to death to observing observable features of the brain. Techniques for studying images showing structures or activities in the brain of an individual who is known to have a particular cognitive deficit and techniques for obtaining information about cerebral processes during the normal performance of a cognitive activity. Postmortem studies offered some of the first insights into how specific lesions or areas of injury in the brain may be associated with particular cognitive deficits. Such studies continue to provide useful insights into how the brain influences cognitive function. Recent technological developments also increasingly enable researchers to study individuals with known cognitive deficits in vivo while the individual is alive. The study of individuals with abnormal cognitive functions linked to cerebral damage often enhances our understanding of normal cognitive functions. Psychobiological researchers also study normal cognitive functioning by studying cerebral activity in animal participants. Researchers often use animals for experiments involving neurosurgical procedures that cannot be performed on humans because such procedures would be difficult, unethical, or impractical. Can cognitive and cerebral functioning of animals and of abnormal humans be generalized to apply to the cognitive and cerebral functioning of normal humans? Psychobiologists have responded to these questions in various ways. Self-reports, case studies, and naturalistic observation Individual experiments and psychobiological studies often focus on precise specification of discrete aspects of cognition across individuals. To obtain richly textured information about how particular individuals think in a broad range of contexts, researchers may use other methods. These methods include self-reports or an individual's own account of cognitive processes, case studies which are in-depth studies of individuals, and naturalistic observation. These are detailed studies of cognitive performance in everyday situations and non-laboratory contexts. Experimental research is most useful for testing hypotheses. However, research based on self-reports, case studies, and naturalistic observation is often particularly useful for the formulation of hypotheses. These methods are also useful to generate descriptions of rare events or processes that we have no other way to measure. In very specific circumstances, these methods may provide the only way to gather information. Similarly, 
Traumatic brain injury cannot be manipulated in humans in the laboratory. Therefore, when traumatic brain injury occurs, case studies are the only way to gather information. For example, consider the case of Phineas Gage or Phineas Gage, a railroad worker who in 1848 had a large metal spike driven through his frontal lobes in a freak accident. Surprisingly, Mr. Gage survived. His behavior and mental processes were drastically changed by the accident. However, obviously we cannot insert large metal rods into the brains of experimental participants. Therefore, in the case of traumatic brain injury, we must rely on case study methods to gather information. The reliability of data based on self-reports depends on the candor of the participants. A participant may misreport information about his or her cognitive processes for a variety of reasons. These reasons can be intentional or unintentional. Intentional misreports can include trying to get edit out and flattering information. Unintentional misreports may involve not understanding the question or not remembering the information accurately. An alternative to a verbal protocol is for participants to report specific information regarding a particular aspect of their cognitive processing. Case studies or an in-depth study of individuals who are exceptionally gifted and naturalistic observations such as detailed observations of the performance of employees operating in nuclear power plants may be used to complement findings from laboratory experiments. These two methods of cognitive research offer high ecological validity. Ecological validity is the degree to which particular findings in one environmental context may be considered relevant outside of that context. Computer Simulations and Artificial Intelligence Digital computers played a fundamental role in the emergence of the study of cognitive psychology. One kind of influence is indirect through models of human cognition based on models of how computers process information. Another kind is direct, through computer simulations and artificial intelligence. In computer simulations, researchers program computers to imitate a given human function or process. Examples are performance on particular cognitive, cognitive tasks such as manipulating objects within three-dimensional space and performance of particular cognitive processes.